It's Friday, March 11. In the headlines, opposition calls for higher minimum wage. Luton Hill residents want a light post removed and our news team journey to the Halfway Tree Primary School to assess the return of face-to-face -face classes. Regionally, Trinidadians warned not to drop their guard and in sports, Bonner and Holder Port West Indies in the lead. This is the News on PBCJ. I'm Gabrielle Thompson. The minimum wage needs to be increased. That's the call from opposition spokesperson on finance planning, Julian Robinson, as he gave his reply to the budget presented in Parliament by Finance Minister Nigel Clark. In February, the government announced that effective April 1, the minimum wage will move from $7,000 per 40-hour work week to $9,000. Mr. Robinson says this is far from what it needed to be. Madam Speaker, my constituent, and to maintain her dignity, I'll call her Cheryl. Yes. She's a single mother of two working as a domestic helper. She earns $10,000 per week, which is above the new minimum wage, and she still can't make ends meet. And I want to share with you what Sharon's weekly bills are. She spends 2000 a week on bus and taxi fare to get to and from work for herself. For her children, she gives 2000 a week for them to get to school. She has to give another 2000 to the children for their lunch money. She spends 1000 for phone credit and internet. She spends 3000 on food, 1000 for electricity, and 2500 for rent. Madam Speaker, that is 13500 the opposition spokesman says the People's National Party believes that moving the minimum wage to $12,000 will better allow Jamaicans to meet their basic needs. We may have to look at how we reorder some of our domestic arrangements. So if you have a domestic helper who works five days a week, you may have to reduce that to four. And you allow her a day to go and work somewhere else yeah. where she can earn some more money. Yeah. Because the $9,000 simply can't allow her to take care of her basic needs. Robinson offered a solution to those who may say employers cannot afford the increase as they earn a fixed income. The People's National Party PNP is calling the recently tabled budget by Dr. Nigel Clark as unrealistic. Opposition spokesperson on finance planning Julian Robinson questioned why the minister did not take into consideration the current crisis happening in Ukraine. He believes that what was presented will balance the books, but is not a true picture of what will be needed, especially since oil prices have increased. Oil price forecast on which this current budget is based. The minister presented a budget based on an oil price of US $67.50 per barrel, a figure which I would consider unrealistic even before we had the full-fledged conflict between Russia and the Ukraine. In fact, at the time last month when the budget was tabled, oil was trading somewhere close to 90 US dollars per barrel due to the demand and supply imbalances as the global economy recovered from COVID-19. Madam Speaker, just this week, the West Texas intermediary traded at $123 per barrel. And the British benchmark, North Sea Crew, traded at also $123 the highest prices in 10 years. And now we have the United States instituting a ban on Russian oil and gas. Mr. Robinson stressed that the current prices are 60% higher than what was budgeted for in the fiscal year 2021 to 2022. He noted the projection was 45 US dollars per barrel, but he says in government's own estimation, it shall rise to 73 US dollars per barrel. Mr. Robinson questioned why the projection for the new fiscal year is lower than what the current year will end on. The minister needs to explain the variance between the ministry's own projection of $67.50 and Petrojan's projection of $79.36 in their public bodies document, both of which were tabled in the House on February 10th. In any event, Madam Speaker, while oil prices may not remain as elevated now for the entire fiscal year, it is highly unlikely that these prices will fall 
to the average of 6750 during the upcoming fiscal year. He says that the higher than projected oil prices will have a negative impact on the trade and current account deficits as the skyrocketing cost of oil is having a snowballing effect on oil prices in an energy intensive local and international economy. He says this will cause businesses and consumers to have reduced disposable income. Residents of Luden Hill in St. Thomas are calling on the Jamaica Public Service Company Limited, JPS, to remove a fallen light post from the roadway. They say it is hindering the progress on work being done on the Southern Coastal Highway Improvement Project. Eyewitnesses say the light post was damaged as a result of an accident last week, including a Toyota Voxy coming from Morant Bay, nearing Pondside. Residents say the driver lost control of the vehicle while trying to avoid potholes. Our newsroom understands that the driver was not seriously injured. It has been a week since full face-to-face -face classes resumed, which was announced by Prime Minister Andrew Holness on February 10. Our news team took a trip to the Halfway Tree Primary School to see how it's going. On March 7, schools opened their doors to their students after a two-year absence due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Principal of the Halfway Tree Primary School says it has been a great week so far. The first day at school, Halfway Tree Primary School, has been a great day. It was a beautiful day. It was an excellent day. We were all happy to see each other. The students were happy to see us and we were very, very excited to see our students. Though there is much excitement surrounding face-to-face -face learning, it has not been without its challenges. They have been doing very well because what happened, we resumed um, full school since Monday, but the children have been out since January. So Monday wasn't a, um, you know, any great difference other than the complete school body was out. Well, I must say, as teachers, the team of teachers here, we had to be very, very vigilant because the problem that I am seeing is that the children have lost the idea of playing. So it starts with playing and then it is ending with a fuss. So we have to try and make sure that they learn to socialize. So we are here to re-socialize them. However, they are putting their best foot forward in making sure the necessary protocols are in place and followed with the help of the parents. Well, the protocols we have in place here first to gain entrance on this, inside the school, the, the students are being sanitized and their temperatures taken. And then they go to the classrooms and then the temperature is being taken again for recording purposes. They have been very, very supportive to the school, the, um, being um, observing the protocols that we have in place. So they have been giving us their support. And they are happy to have the children out. So they are willing, <laughs> they are willing to give us that support that we need. At Halfway Tree, with teamwork between both teachers and students, they have embodied their school motto striving for excellence. For the news on PBCJ, I am Anna K. Simpson. In today's extended edition of the Business Report, Danita Rodney takes a look at daily market updates and features social learning company Edufocal. It started as a simple dream. Now, 12 years later, Edufocal Limited is a multi-million dollar company and one of the top tech ed companies in the Caribbean and Latin Americas in 2021, helping students to learn and excel through online interactions. When asked about his journey by Don Fiok on the Mayberry Investments Virtual Forum, founder and CEO of Edufocal, Gordon Swaybury, expressed his gratitude to those who helped him along the way. So Dan, you know, I have to start by being grateful and showing gratitude to the many parties and stakeholders that were involved and have been involved in this process. You know, um, my team, my board, 
Mayberry Investments Limited. Um, so many people have been involved in this process. My parents, my wife, you know, even my son, even my 18-month-old <laughs> son has been a key part um, in this process. But Dan, if I was to talk about the entire history or the entire arc of Edufocal, it would take the entire forum. So I think a good place to start um, would be the fact that I've been a Mayberry client for about five to six years. I remember um, trying to get a Mayberry account and you know, there was a, a $1 million um, requirement. <laughs> I, I didn't have that $1 million at the time, but I was able to convince one of the um, sales reps to, to, to get me an account. Anyway, I share that story because um, I was invited, or I tagged along with a friend of mine, Kirk Anthony Hamilton, about two and a half years ago to a Mayberry Investor Forum. So it was right before the pandemic. And I was um, reintroduced to a Christopher Berry. Um, this, is, this was February 2020. And you know, I was just telling Chris about what Edifocal is, where we're going, some of the things we have in the pipeline. And he was seemingly interested. Took my number. Um, I, you know, gave me his number. And the day, you know, a day later, I called him just to kind of bounce something off him. And he, he made an offer over WhatsApp to buy a stake in Edufocal, and he told me that I had until the end of the day yeah. <laughs> to, to, to accept the offer and that he would not negotiate on his offer. Um, <clears throat> saying yes to Chris on that investment is one of the best decisions I've ever made um, for Edufocal. And you know that initial investment started a series of events that has led us here. Um, for me, there's no better partner than Mayberry, in fact, about five, six years ago, you know, I made a tweet saying that, you know, maybe I release the companies that matter, which, I, I mean, I think it's a fact. But the point is, um, that started the journey and it's been a long journey. Um, I certainly went in, went in thinking that I was ready to list at the time, this was 2020, but I was nowhere near ready to list than um, yourself, Gary, Chris, um, walked me through the entire process and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a different person, Edifocal is a better company for it. The company we started with 13,000 US dollars has seen significant profits in their revenue over the last few years that has led it to the place where it was listed as an IPO on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. During an interview on Taking Stock Live, Mr. Swaby shared the company's financial status. So this is our five-year financials starting in 2016 to 2020. Um, in 2016, we did 6.7 million in revenue, seven, $789,000 in, you know, in a loss, um, after tax loss. Well, there's no tax if you, if you have a loss. Um, 2017, 8.8 million in revenue, 1.4 million loss. December 20, 2018, rather, um, 9.2 million in revenue, 8.9 million in loss. December 2019, 26.8 million in revenue, 7.1 um 7.1 million in, in last then 2020 big year for us we jumped from 26.8 million in revenue to 102 million um 102.6 million the company which opened and closed sale on monday march 3 2022 earned over 400 million dollars a long way from the desired 130 million in foreign exchange trading for thursday march 10 the U.S. dollar sold for an average of $154.05. The Canadian dollar ended trading at $120.14. The pound sterling traded for $202.71. And the euro sold for an average of $169.65. The following reflects the movements of the JC indices in Thursday's trading session. The JSC index advanced by 11,265 points to close at under 400,000 units. The junior market index advanced by 70 points to close at over 3,000 units. The combined market index advanced by 11,173 points to close at over 400,000 units. And the All Jamaican Composite Index advanced by 1,744 points to close at over 442,000 units. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 105 stocks, of which 53 advanced, 36 declined, and 16 traded firm. Stocks advanced for 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited, Access Financial Services Limited, and Barita Investments Limited. Stocks declined for 
1834 Investments Limited, AMG Packaging and Paper Company Limited, and Caribbean Cream Limited. CAC 2000 Limited, Caribbean Assurance Brokers Limited, and Consolidated Bakeries Jamaica Limited traded firm. Future Energy Source Company Limited Ordinary Shares was the volume leader with over 6 million units, followed by Indies Pharma Jamaica Limited Ordinary Shares with over 5 million units, and Wigton Wind Farm Limited Ordinary Shares with over 3.5 million units. In market data for oil, oil prices rose on Friday on continued concerns about supply disruptions for Russian oil and oil products, but were on track for their biggest weekly decline since November after another volatile week. Brent crude futures climbed $2.86, or 2.6%, to $112.19 a barrel. West Texas Intermediate Crude Futures were up $2.71, or 2.6%, to $108.73 a barrel. And that was the Extended Business Report on PBCJ. I'm Danita Rodney. In regional news, we begin in Trinidad and Tobago, where the country's health secretary in response to recent talks of COVID-19 now being classified as an endemic, urged citizens to not drop their hands as the virus is unpredictable. More in this report from TTT Live. We cannot relax. This was the message sent from Secretary for Health, Wellness and Social Protection at Wednesday's post-executive media briefing. Dr. Faith B. Israel responded to the recent talks of COVID-19 being now classified as an endemic. That an endemic does not mean that COVID is over. In fact, the textbook definition of endemic is one where you have a high but constant high rates of infection of a particular disease. So in this situation, we have a constant but high number of COVID-19 cases circulating in Trinidad and Tobago. Last year, this time, we were actually at a lull. And we made the mistake at that point of thinking that the COVID-19 pandemic was over we made the mistake of thinking that it was over and that we could relax a little bit. And we realized shortly after that, that we had boom, cases, boom, variants, boom. We are now talking about things like Delta. In news from the Bahamas, Carnival Cruise Lines has announced that it will be gifting $300 million worth of projects to mark its 50th birthday. Berthony McDermott attended a special celebration where the company's president announced investments for Grand Bahama and Little San Salvador and filed this support. As Carnival Cruise Line celebrates 50 years, President Christine Duffy announcing a $200 million project for Grand Bahama and $100 million worth of enhancements for Half Moon Key in Little San Salvador. Combined, the projects are expected to provide 1,000 jobs. She said the goal is to bring more Carnival ships and passengers to the Bahamas, which will result in more job opportunities. Representing a $200 million investment, the Grand Bahama Cruise Port will offer guests a spectacular beachfront and exciting Bahamian experiences. The port will offer many job opportunities, including the chance for local entrepreneurs to feature Bahamian food and retail items. It will open the door to Grand Bahama, and we expect, we know, it will bring a positive economic impact for the local community. Now, in his address to Carnival's 50th birthday celebration, Prime Minister Philip Davis says he's looking forward to Carnival's development in Grand Bahama and what it will mean for that island's economy. I'm personally looking forward to the Carnival Cruise Line port in Grand Bahama, as well as the new multi-cruise line partnership for a shipyard that will provide opportunities for local residents. When asked for a timeline on the project, Tourism Minister Chester Cooper reveals that government is in the advanced stages of approvals. The announcement comes as the Grand Bahamian economy is still reeling from the devastating impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and Hurricane Dorian, which ravaged that northern island. She said plans are also underway to build a pier at Half Moon Key, which would allow for larger vessels. $100 million of enhancements are planned for the island of Little San Salvador home to the beautiful beaches of Half Moon Cay. 
Continuing with news from the Bahamas, amid the reignited discussion and debate about marital rape, Social Services Manager Obi Wilchcombe says the issue may soon be resolved. Minister of Social Services and Urban Development Obi Wilchcombe says there's been close work with the Attorney General and the government is very near to legislation that addresses the marital rape issue. We are addressing it uh, to arrive at what we put before the Parliament and for consideration. Of course, it's being discussed widely, being discussed among the women uh, and with the various groups. Uh, we want to arrive at something that we can all live with every single day and recognize that every woman should be respected. Every woman should be given love and honor every single day. Wilshkamp said advancing gender equality laws isn't always as simple as it sounds. Gender equality is uh, uh, wide-ranging uh, in the workplace, in the political arena, uh, with pay, uh, with everything that relates to equality. Uh, and of course, we can't forget other groups such as the dis disability and uh, equality for all. And our government is committed to such. Wilshkam emphasized that the ongoing dialogue is important. We have to fully comprehend and appreciate the importance of democracy, freedom of speech. That's where we are. It ought not be driven by just a government or by a single group of individuals. Have a broad cross-section of dialogue on these issues because that's how you advance democracy and freedom of speech. For our news, I'm Kale Campbell. And in Grenada, officials from the Ministry of Agriculture are in full support of the revival of 100 acres of land in St. George aimed at the increased access to properties for improved food and nutrition security. Rena Pay Thomas tells us more. The Ministry of Agriculture, Lands and Forestry has pledged its support to a local private venture that has already put boots on the ground towards the revitalization of 100 acres of arable lands in St. George. The project, in good hope, is being undertaken by the Grenada Real Estate Corporation and aims to promote increased access to land for improved food and nutrition security. Leroy Nichols, representative of the board, explained that the cooperation is looking forward to working with people who are serious about the venture. What we're interested in is getting serious people to farm. We want somebody that's seriously interested in farming. You come in and you farm, you plant your whatever vegetables thing and so on, and you seriously um, develop in the area. According to Nichols, the board has put in place several critical services to alleviate the challenges that farmers may face. We are making the lands available. Okay. We recognize to the, the challenges that the farmers have had with equipment, and roads, things of the sort, right? Water and so forth. Water and so forth. So my board has taken the decision that we're going to work with government because we're talking food security and all of that sort of stuff, right? So let's work with government to see, especially at this time, it's critical that we become self-sufficient as far as possible, okay? So against that background, we have already purchased a new Massey Ferguson tractor, which we have, so that we'll be able to provide flowing services for the farm. Over now to sports. The Jamaica Paralympic Association and the Paralympic Movement in Jamaica will today celebrate Paralympic Day declared in a proclamation issued by Governor General Sir Patrick Allen. And in cricket, batsman and Kruma Bonner showed tremendous powers of concentration as his century on day three earned the West Indies a handy lead of 62 runs over England in the first Apex test in Antigua. Returning from their overnight 202 for four in reply to the visitors' first innings score of 311. The wind is reached 373 for nine at stumps. It's time now for our Friday feature. On March 3, the Hope Zoo in Kingston celebrated World Wildlife Day. The day was dedicated to educating the future generations about the importance of recovering and restoring endangered species around the world. Kyla Thomas Hewitt tells us more. Thursday, March 3, saw the celebration of World Wildlife Day around the world. This year's theme focused on the recovery of key species and ecosystem restoration 
and seeks to draw attention to the conservation status of some of the most critically endangered species and to drive discussions towards imagining and implementing solutions to conserve them. In an effort to stay true to the theme, Hope Zoo and its organizers hosted approximately 200 students from various schools across the island. Executive Chairman of Hope Zoo, Mr. Kenneth Benjamin, spoke to a few ways the organization has done its part in recovery and conservation. We have successfully hatched and released over 600 iguanas into the hills of Helcher. We have planted thousands of trees all over Jamaica, helped with the collection of plastic bottles for recycling, rehabilitated various national endangered wildlife species, and where possible, released them back into the wild. The day saw the children interacting and learning about the various animals hosted by the zoo. When asked the purpose of the day, marketing director Patrice Levy said that it was a step in educating the children of tomorrow and highlighted a few of the species and their importance. We believe that if you start young and you give them the information when they're younger, then as they grow, they too will pass on that information. Um, we have done um, key conservation, the Iguana Head Start um, program. This is where the Iguana are housed. And the Jamaican Iguana is, I mean, they are the first farmers and they are key in um, our forestry preservation. And we also do the American crocodile, and they also are key in the wetlands and keeping the rivers clean and um, a balance. So they're very important, and it's, we continue to educate and do outreach programs to, to get people to understand how important and valuable they are to our country and how to protect them. Ms. Levy, in an address to the public, says, we need to remember that wildlife cannot exist without us, and we cannot exist without wildlife, and that there has to be a balance for us to live cohesively. For PBCJ News, I'm Carla Thomas-Hewitt. And that's the news for today. On behalf of our entire news production team, thanks for making it PBCJ, the People's Station.